Today at the National Press Club, broadcaster Alan Jones. During a career spanning more than 25 years, the radio host has dominated the Sydney market. Mr Jones has also coached the Australian Rugby Union side. Today, Alan Jones speaks on food security and the protection of the Australian regional way of life. From the National Press Club. Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, sorry, welcome to the National Press Club and today's National Australia Bank Address. Our guest today uh, needs very little introduction. He was described last night on the ABC, I noticed, as um, the most powerful broadcaster in the land. So uh, he's certainly uh, well known to people. Uh, Alan Jones uh, has, is a controversial figure. He uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, shy away from controversy, as is well known. And uh, he's going to talk to us today about food security and the Australian way of life. Alan, I'm glad to see that uh, you, you didn't encounter any uh, border restrictions when you came to the ACT, unlike the uh, convoy of no confidence not so long ago. Um, and uh, so without further ado, Alan Jones. Thank you, Mark. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, I must say I noted that in the correspondence of July 21, when Morris Riley was writing to me about this, the topic was sport, rugby, media and politics. And quote, can we fix the Wallabies culture in time for the World Cup? Uh, I'm still happy to do that, by the way, but I think it's just a touch late. Um, having suggested then that the title of the speech was entirely up to me, somewhere along the line it was confirmed by the club that the title of the address should be Australia's National Interest, Food Security and the Protection of the Australian Regional Way of Life. I have to confess that I am more than delighted that an opportunity has been given for these issues to be canvassed nationally. But may I say at the outset, I'm simply talking about our land that has fed the Australian people for the past 200 years. And without seeking permission from the Australian community at either an election or a referendum, our politicians are turning some of our best land into a quarry and a worthless lunar moonscape. The great artesian basin and our underground aquifers are being risked for the next 200 years by fracking and the use of toxic chemicals. Scientists admit that nobody fully understands the complex interconnectivity of these systems or how they really work. Yet no matter where I go in the bush, salt is the elephant in the room, the one thing that politicians and the mining companies don't want to talk about. The truth is there are no solutions for all the mountains of salt that will be dragged to the surface at every coal seam gas site. Ask any farmer, any scientist, any ordinary suburban gardener what salt will do to their soil and they'll tell you. May I say this firstly, I come from the land in Western Queensland, a land of drought. I know the worth of water. I grew up watching stock go without it, perishing in the drought. We have governments that are silly enough to give coal seam gas and coal mining companies the right to plunder our best agricultural land and as well extract half as much water out of the Great Artesian Basin as we know we can sustainably use. And on top of all of this, we're allowing some of our best agricultural land to be sold to foreign interests. Twice in the last month, the former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd has spoken on the issue of global food security. At a conference to agricultural scientists in Brisbane last month, he warned that governments must tackle global food security or risk his words, wars, political chaos and large movements of environmental refugees, including to Australia. He wanted food security be to be on the agenda of this week's Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Perth and the G20 meeting in Cannes in November. Mr Rudd told the scientists in Brisbane that global food production would need to increase by 70 per cent by the middle of the century to feed an expected world population of 9.3 billion. And he said, and I quote, failing to address the challenge of food insecurity would have political, social and broader social security repercussions. Mr Rudd said, political conflict, war and large numbers of internally displaced people will be affecting all our countries. At about the same time, the Minister for Trade, Craig Emerson, also representing a Queensland seat, though born in New South Wales, predicted that exporting food to Asia would provide, his words, a massive opportunity 
for Australia to further cast in on the urbanisation of Asia. Well, most of us would agree with that. Dr Emerson said, as one billion extra people inhabit the region by 2035, and the proportion of Asia's population living in urban areas increases from 42% to 55%, the demand for protein-rich food, he said, is set to soar. The irony of those comments is that both Mr Rudd and Dr Emerson represent Queensland electorates. In nothing that they said did they make any reference to the fact that Queensland is allowing mining interests to plunder the very land that could guarantee our food security or, in Dr Emerson's words, guarantee a massive opportunity for Australia in Asia. The world's population is projected to increase dramatically in the next 50 years. Food shortages, as both Mr Rudd and Dr Emerson have said, are imminent. Yet the amount of Australian land dedicated to agriculture has fallen by 20% since 1976. Since 1976, farmers have abandoned more than 100 million acres of land. Fed up, they sell to government or overseas interests or mining companies, or they are bamboozled by mining companies and don't know what to do. Our agricultural heritage is progressively being eroded. Let me begin by saying I'm not opposed to coal mining or coal seam gas mining. I'm opposed to the arrogance with which these people think they can go anywhere, do what they want and get away with it. There is a saying, when the light appears, the birds begin to sing. When the truth starts to come out, people find the courage to talk. People are not just talking now, I can assure you. They have decided in thousands to do something. They are locking the gate. And the mining industry, needing access to be able to function, have a monumental battle on their hands. This is not just a battle about mining prime farm land or destroying fresh water or covering our land with salt or risking public health. This is about something far more damaging and dangerous. The loss of our rights as Australian citizens, the loss of the basic freedoms we have always taken for granted. The state and federal governments have conspired to remove our rights over the ownership of our land. They have deliberately conspired to bully, to abuse and to force Australians into court if they don't comply with the demands of foreign-owned multinational mining companies. In fact, in Queensland, they issue special manuals as to how Australian farmers must behave in their negotiations with mining companies, in tips for landholders negotiating agreements with resource companies issued by the Bly government in November last year. It says, quote, Regardless of how you feel about the activities taking place on your land, you're encouraged to develop a courteous and cooperative working relationship towards the resource company. And in the next sentence they warn, quote, how costly, stressful and time consuming going to court will be. Santos recently made a presentation to the Stock Exchange. On the 26th of September, they presented slide after slide after slide to justify why Santos would be an excellent investment project. And these slides talked about Santos being strategically positioned for market access, their words. And they provided a map to the Stock Exchange, slide 23, of the Gunnedah Basin, telling investors, quote, Gunnedah Basin coals are world class, with appraisal programs confirming confidence and known resources in excess of 12,000 petajoules. Now, to give you some idea, New South Wales gas consumption currently is about 160 petajoules per annum. It's thought to grow to about 550 in the next 20 years. Santos is saying that Gunnedah alone has resources of 12,000 petajoules of gas. And they'll walk over or invade prime agricultural land to get it. And there's the map presented to the Stock Exchange. It mentions the towns, Gundawindi to Dubbo, taking in Moree, Walgut, Narrabri, Gunnedah, Tamworth, Crindai, Scone, Coonabarabran, Canamble and Gulgong. They're all there. This is amongst the finest agricultural land in the world. And Santos are currently running ads designed to induce in those who see them a sense of feeling that this is all pretty mundane, straightforward, very safe. Well, they don't tell you what the ads should tell us. They're frightened to show us a map of the gas wells and what they look like. They're frightened to show us a map of the all-weather roads that will, needed, will be needed to service the gas wells. 
They are frightened to show us a map of the topsoil, which will need to be removed for pipe construction to connect the gas wells. They are frightened to tell us where the employees will go, because they will have recreational needs and they will need to be administrative quarters. They are frightened to tell us that these coal seam gas initiatives will become large industrial estates. They don't tell us any of this. They will require many, many hectares. Santos don't tell us how many compressors they will need. They don't tell us what they'll do with the gas or the water. They say nothing about the reverse osmosis treatment plant, which you'll be able to hear for miles. They don't tell us once the water is treated where you'll store it, because the volumes will be greater than several Sydney harbours. They don't tell us where they'll put the residue. They don't tell us where the salt will go or what it will do to the soil. They don't tell us that it's a 24-7 operation. In other words, they don't tell us what a fully blown gas field looks like. And the reason they don't tell us is they think farmers will cop this nonsense. Well, I've got news for Santos and others, the farmers won't, because what coal seam gas and open cut coal mining are making into industrial zones now, in 30 years, they'll be industrial wastelands. Read the Darling Downs, the Liverpool Plains, the Gloucester and Stroud Valleys, the Fitzroy Basin, Felton Valley, Bacchus Marsh in, Tasma in Victoria. And have a look at the beautiful well camp on the edge of Toowoomba, destined to be an industrial zone. And mining, of course. You name it, it's everywhere. And I say over and over again, have a look at open cut mining. Take a helicopter across the Hunter Valley. The land was supposed to be rehabilitated. It can't be. It's like a crater of the moon. Following the public meeting in Gunnedah last week, the second of its kind by angry farmers, the Sydney Morning Herald editorialised, and I quote, Decisions to exploit energy resources must not be made prematurely so that they preempt the decision to protect the best agricultural land in a continent where it is in short supply. There should be no hurry. There is reason to believe that Australia already has too many coal seam gas projects being developed all at once. It's time to pause, the editorial said. The gas does not degrade if it stays in the ground. There's plenty of time to devise a course of action which balances all interests. Now, I'm not talking melodrama here. I'm talking reality. I have seen elderly farmers pushed off their farms by New Hope Coal and paid so little for their land that they're forced to live out their lives as paupers. Yet because the farms were held under pre-1910 land releases, there is a significance in that these farmers actually owned all the royalties to the coal under the land. But they didn't know that. And they're too afraid to talk to the media because they've been forced to sign confidentiality agreements. They are the victims of legalised theft.